Good morning, everybody in the audience. My name is Irene Bosch. I'm a virologist by training, and today we will be covering the topic of antigen tests, viral antigen tests, and making an emphasis in our experience during the COVID epidemic and the studies that we have now undergo. Uh, I represent IDX20. This is a startup in the area of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm the CEO and I, I represent a much bigger, larger team of excellent scientists and colleagues. So the talk will be divided in giving you an introduction of the problem. We could uh, go over the history of what antigen tests had been um, for COVID-19 epidemic. We will then go into current data that we have in clinical studies in Massachusetts, and we will talk about image analysis methodologies and conclusions. The um, next slide wants to give you an overview of the antigen test problem and position what has happened in particular. Antigen means protein, and antigen tests have proven to be a key component for controlling viral spread during the COVID epidemic, but um, they were not available early times in the epidemic. And even though this uh, today we have a lot of knowledge about antigen tests, that wasn't the case early on. The uh, several issues that impact the regulatory approval, such as their lower accuracy compared to PCR, and PCR is a technique that detects the nucleic acid of the virus, not the protein, have to do with the variable performance in the real world settings for antigen tests, especially among vulnerable populations, and their limited real-time reporting to the appropriate public health authorities because antigen tests are, by definition, very simple, do not require any machines, do not require any uh, laboratory, and are done in the privacy of the home. And that requires its spread of information from the user, the person, to that public entity. And that has been a challenge. Also, it's uh, important to note that due to the very difficult regulatory process, studies that correlate faster and you know, easy to do laboratory validations of accuracy of the antigen test and compared to the clinical performance required by regulatory science have not been um, well documented or done. Therefore, hopefully what we address today, be, um, it's of interest and more important, addresses a, uh, a problem that has a public interest. Um, in addition, these are very simple tests, but yet they're, they're not that completely simple in the sense that they can offer uh, much more, and we'll go hopefully over this uh, topic today. Uh, in terms of why uh, a validation of a test could be quite important or had relevance in, in, the, in the near future, is because the price of these tests could be um, could be more affordable. We uh, hope that, or the vision is that by having more numbers of these antigen tests in the market, will definitely um, uh, open the competition for lower price and availability to the population, especially vulnerable populations. It's also important because it would create standardized protocols to validate the tests and um, across the board and not just in the United States, but globally. And therefore, uh, lastly, uh, it also increases the information that currently we could acquire from an antigen test, because going through these validation processes, we will see how it correlates the simple image analysis and the intensity of the band that we all know an antigen test looks like today, that test band. Uh, over a white background has much more information and that information could be actually relevant to the um, outcome of the disease, to the um, prompt medical treatment, and therefore has implications that are um, of relevance. Okay, so 
where and how do we go about providing better um, ways to validate these tests? So what we did in this particular example that we will be presenting today, we, we selected a part or a, a geographical area. This is near Boston, the city of Chelsea. And the city of Chelsea has very specific characteristics. In this graph, we see how the wave of um, COVID in a monthly basis during 2022 was a much higher impact in, in um, Chelsea City compared to the state of Massachusetts. And this is because Chelsea itself has an, a few, uh, few problems uh, population Wide, wide, it has uh, overcrowded conditions. It's the second most crowded city in, in Massachusetts. It has about 80% of the residents consider essential workers. That means they have to go to work even during the surge of cases of COVID. And um, in addition, therefore, the incremental exposure to virus. In addition, uh, this uh, city has over 60% of the Hispanic Latino residents and immigrants, which uh, poses a challenge for um, English barrier and socioeconomical barriers. So we wanted to work with this particular vulnerable population. And um, now the how we do it for validations of tests, we can see here, we propose ha to have a weekly protocol. This is a clinical protocol, clinical study by which we work with the residents of the um, uh, elderly senior housing. This provided us a, a good, uh, solid cohort of people to follow over a year. Uh, we are right now about five months um, in this project. And what it, what it consists of is to bring testing every week to their homes their lobby areas, their building, have them um, use a simple phone with a camera. So it is important to note that we are very emphatic on the digital portion of these antigen testing, not just the performance by a nurse or a doctor or a health provider, but by themselves, by the people themselves, and be able to um, propagate that information further uh, on their own. And once they test themselves with an antigen test, there is a cartoon of the various antigen tests we have in the project. These are antigen tests that have not yet obtained an uh, emergency use authorization in, in the United States, but had been already validated to be highly performing tests, uh, antigen tests. And then after that, if the, every week, if that person becomes positive, that person goes home, isolates, and it gets tested for eight consecutive times every day. Every single point of that um, event is being collected digitally. And we are now showing you a few examples of such um, data and how we collect, and then an overview of how we collect the digital portion. This is done by a collaboration with a BioIT. It's a company that is specializes in data management. And we collect the not just the, the antigen test per se, of course, but also a health questionnaire that um, looks into the profile of that person in that particular day. Symptoms, not numbers of days of symptoms prior to the testing. It collects vaccination history. And it um, collects also PCR once the test is positive, as well as random negative PCR, so that we didn't have to do each negative PCR, but we do collect random negative PCRs. And that PCR that is positive goes along with a positive test that the phone camera is collecting. And you see that in the top part of, of the slide where there's a camera. And every single test that reaches the hands of these individuals, participants, have a QR code that is interpreted within the the digital system. All right. In the top part on the left, you see how aggregated data over the last five months that we would be we had been working shows in green negativity and in red positivity. And those peaks do correspond exactly with the peaks you saw on incidents of Massachusetts and Chelsea, where there were was a surge of uh, cases of Omicron BA1. In, in January, and then 
VA2, VA5 later on. And those are exactly those two peaks that you see as well here. By May, we have VA2 and later on VA5. We have some graphical output on the ethnicity of our participants showing that indeed there is a majority, half of them are of um, a Hispanic origin. And it was interesting in race because in, in purple, um, almost half of the people could not characterize them as a normal sort of like standardized race. It's more like uh, recognize themselves as a mix. They're not white, they're not African-American, but yet um, not Asian, but a mix. So that, that is an interesting point. We have been now doing a, more than 3,000 tests, and you see them in the graphics on the bottom. We have there the names of the tests that participate in this particular study as well. And again, um, not yet through approval of FDA. They are um, in agreement, of course, to uh, show some of the preliminary data we will be showing today. A uh, interesting point that we want to raise is the acute phase of the disease by which we know it goes from low amount of virus, then it, it increases either plateaus and then goes down. And I will uh, walk you through some interesting uh, cases we, we found in, in our study so far. And what you see here in the y-axis is a delta CT. And the CT cycles in, in the PCR are uh, normalized by um, the viral load normalized to the human gene just to allow comparison to, from sample to sample because it means uh, the CTs will always be in relation to the amount of input into the machine. So that CT value is of importance there. The two genes that we target of the SARS-CoV-2 are N and open breeding frame 1AB. And, and then on the, in the x-axis, you see the progression of the disease in days. And in this case, in dates, because we put the month and the, the day of the month. And um, interestingly enough, in the upper central part, there is an unvaccinated individual in this uh, Delta CT over 30, which is two to the 30 fold more viruses than any of the other examples that you see in the lower part, which are just the uh, other participants. So indeed, uh, um, judging by this quantification, the unvaccinated participant had a significant more viral load through the acute phase. On the left, you see another case of higher viral load with a pregnancy case, and it resolved itself. So that's why you see that um, it goes down. So the down means less virus. And then you see on the right uh, an interesting case of a rebound on a vasculitis comorbidity case that even though the person resolved the infection, it bumped up later on. Uh, on the bottom, an example of um, an antiviral treatment where you see it, it deep and constant slow slope going down. That's pretty dramatic. We've seen that with several of the treated participants that nowadays have access to the antiviral treatment. Very, very significant change in the shape of the curve as well. And then the last two um, on the bottom left and cent uh, right and center are two examples of a, a participants that are characteristics. This is in the middle, a 20 to 30 year old type of uh, viral load goes up and down rapidly and, and, and the days are underscore after the participant ID. Those are the numbers of days that we recorded and a over 60 year, year old on the right. So and the 60 year old on over had sort of a plateau um, with a bit of a lingering more virus. So this is just an example of the quality and type of analysis that we could derive from the parallel PCR to antigen. Now going more into what we're doing for the antigen tests themselves, we have here a cartoon of the methodology. Basically in the lab, what we do is that we take either the recombinant nucleoprotein, which is the target of the antigen test, or we also work with heat inactivated, chemically inactivated relevant SARS, uh, Delta and Omicron strains in separately or live virus because we do have access to BSL-3 kind of lab 
level of security. And what we do here is that we're going to do a um, sort of a range of range of concentrations of these targets and analyze the image analysis that we obtained after uh, looking into the photographs of these various amounts of input, either call it protein or virus. Um, and the virus, in, for quantification of the virus, we use platforming units per ml, which is a way in the lab to count how many live viruses we have. In the left side, it's the protocol use. Basically, we do triplicates. We do 14 different uh, 2x dilutions. So we have plenty of dots. And you see them uh, organized in a langmore trinvik fit. This is just basically the shape of the, the dots or the intensity in pixel and grayscale. And um, that is normalized from zero to one in the y-axis. And in the x-axis, you see the amount of virus, meaning the more intense towards one, it's when you have more virus, of course. And then you will have reaching towards the left, the limit of detection. And this limit of detection, the contribution that we do here is very specific. We have a plugin to ImageJ. ImageJ is a free software made by the NIH many years ago. And that um, allows the user, being the manufacturer, being a regulatory science person, to plug in the data on, the, on that intensity and obtain immediately from that the limit of detection of that particular experiment. And in this case, it's a triplicate um, uh, limit of detection on a triplicate experiment on a chemically inactivated virus. So that is um, a very simple way to immediately obtain uh, values of, of uh, performance that were not available in, in, in the past. The graphical ways in which we output this performance are also very friendly. And you have either the Langmore curve itself. And here, what we did is we compare three different tests that are rolled into our study versus one test that has already been um, approved to be used at home. In this case, it's called the ONGO. And the limit of detection is in box and whiskers, where the whiskers depict the 95% um, confidence interval. And what you see here, the lower it is, the better it is for um, accuracy. In this case, on go had actually less accuracy uh, measured side by side in the lab with viruses or with protein as well, and than the other three that we've been studying. Another piece of the methodology is the one of the methodology that correlates the I side, the yes or no binary, with the uh, limit of detection that we just spoke about. And we do that doing relational models. And you will see immediately what that does. Basically, you have a fit core curve with the lab performance and a fit curve with the same um, uh, curve of protein or virus, but then you ask a user to tell you whether they see or do not see the band, the test band in the antigen test. And that's what we have graphed on the right. And what we do now is that we merge those two ways of detection using the dispersion or the probability of dispersion of the LOD, and we combine both. And those are the relational models that we will then have ready for tr um, transcribing the experience in the lab to the more experience in the real world, which is based only on uh, naked eye assessment. And we will not show you much uh, today about the results, but this is all ongoing. And what we see that indeed, you could then do probabilities of correcting the lab performance on the right and it turns out that the eye performance, zero or one, is actually uh, lower, the limit of detection, than what you do in the lab, which is a mathematical um, detection. And then the two get merged to correct the real or model the, the lab detection to a more real condition. And that's what you see uh, as the red line. So we merge the two to generate a new model line. Uh, lastly, the 
probability uh, of performance uh, positive or the percent po positive agreement, which is what the regulatory science asks uh, today about these tests, can be modeled throughout the whole range of, uh, in this case, PCR, which is the gold standard. And what you see here is a regression line that associates in the clinical setting all the PCRs that we have found um, side by side to the antigen test. And the antigen test is being assessed yes or no uh, with a binary um, method. And here we see that for an 80% correspondence, you can have the whole correspondence range, of course. Uh, in this case, the CT value is it depicts less CT vir virus means more virus and higher CT values is less. So you could see how 100% performance you will get in a, 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 this given test, the AS15 from Blanford, that uh, anything above 30 C, uh, below 30 CTs, right? Or more virus than the 30 CT threshold, it's already an 80% correspondence. So this kinds of analyses allowed um, or will allow a, probably a much faster validation than what we have today, which has been the bottleneck for approving large numbers of tests and having them in the hands of users in the right moment to control and mitigate uh, a pandemic such as the COVID or any other that would come uh, our way. Uh, hopefully not the, the monkey pots, but it looks like we're facing that challenge as we speak. So to conclude, um, for what we have spoken today, we have talked about lateral flow tests being um, more than just a test digital reporting device, that the methodology for image analysis can be user friendly and can be supported across different labs and regions, regions of the world if we have a method or methodology that, that is transportable, such as the one we showed today. And, and in the hands of manufacturers and regulatory bodies, these techniques could be really facilitating uh, a validation that doesn't exist today. And it's simply using a camera uh, from a phone could, could give that opportunity. So current validation processes require these complex and expensive clinical trials. And we do believe that replacing those very complex trials to a much more simple and time less time consuming method would be a, a good thing to have in, in, in the hands of everybody, including uh, FDA. And uh, the complex relational models that we alluded today use uh, the probability theory and are a good way, a proper way to translate the lab performance to a more uh, real world data and merge the, the two and eventually model uh, what you could do by not going through a clinical setting, but yet doing a proper lab performance of a test or a series of performances just on the lab side. And with that, I would like to thank the audience and welcome any questions.